Good afternoon, so welcome to Le Corbusier Hall, Moscow Urban Forum. So today we're going to discuss the creative industries of the economy and their impact on the cities of the futures. My name is Vasily Usmanov. Over the last 10 years I've been engaged in media, which is described as a creative uh, industry. Now I'm responsible for the strategies in these industries. I would like to talk about how the cities are going to respond to the bigger importance of creative industries for the economy of this city, the creative economy itself, how it is going to correlate with the digital economy, with the service economy, and with new urban concepts. So today, at the, our round table, we have just great distinguished guests. I'd like to introduce them one by one today. We have Ru Marrera, the mayor of Porto. I'm going through my list of guests. Alisa Prudnikova, director for the regional development. Rosizo Gessi. Vladimir Filipov, the deputy head of the Department of Culture of Moscow. Metin Hakverdi, the deputy of the Bundestag from Hamburg, Rovan Herbt, the advisor to the mayor of Amsterdam responsible for the development of the creative industries, co-founder of the agency agency, and Sergei Disatov, director general of the design center Art Play. So the person who is late, the person who created and described the notion of the creative industry. <coughs> so we uh, have the opportunity to be very creative in terms of our schedule and timetable. I would skip the presentation of uh, Richard and we'll start with uh, Metin and the project in Hamburg, which you are dealing with. The cultural center, you invest in huge money. How do you think? For the cities, such investment uh, and spending on the culture can be explained. Can they explain be economically and for the better city living of the citizens, for the better mood of the citizens? How do you see that? Can you tell us in detail uh, how you do this project? Thank you, Vasily, for giving me the time uh, to um, to take. Um, a look at a local project, but it is a huge project internationally wise. The building, the, the Hamburg Philharmonie, a, Philharmonie, uh, a concert building hall, uh, which, is, um, which, is, um, which has its predecessors in other cities, uh, uh, in other cities in the world. Uh, Sydney is always a big example for such a big music hall, um, is a one billion euro project. So it is a huge building. It is a huge building, very expensive building, and a huge investment from, of the city of Hamburg and the cultural scene of, of the city. And obviously it has to uh, attract <coughs> more people outside Hamburg and not just only the people within the city, because the city itself is uh, too small for such a huge uh, project. <coughs> and it's supposed to do a lot of things uh, inside and outside the city, attract tourism to the city, but also make the city, how should I say it, um, more livable. To, to raise the living standards within the city just to have uh, a better cultural program. Um, this, uh, this project has been planned very, very long term, very long term, um, and it uh, took actually seven years longer to build it than it was originally planned, and it, 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 and it cost much more than it was originally planned. Um, I don't know whether you remember the G20 summit um, in Hamburg uh, last year. Um, there was a, a concert at the end of the G summit that happened within that building, so it is also a representative factor. So what you can see is uh, if you put it in high and low, this would be the higher standard of cultural investments into the infrastructure of a city. Um, but I just want to take the time really, really uh, shortly to, to point out that there are also very, very small programs because the city of Hamburg is obviously a city that has had a harbor for, for over 800 years now. And the harbor infrastructure and the economy of the harbor has totally totally changed several times within the history. And the last uh, industrialization and automation and digitalization of the harbor uh, had the result that a lot less space is needed for international trade and harboring uh, 
uh, in big cities. So there's a lot of space left within the city that has actually been used in the past by old industrial sites, and they have to change, they have to be switched into something new. And within this something new, uh, creative economy, uh, new spaces for, for working spaces, for anything that is new now, and that will have uh, an influence on, on the <coughs> development of cities generally, is not just uh, be accepted, but it is used as a technique, as a tool to develop those parts that have not been developed for the past maybe 200 or 300 years because they were harbor sites. So it's interesting not to have just this, those big projects where you have big influences but also very small ones to create neighborhoods, to, 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 uh, to have a, an impact on a development where, the where you don't even know the result of just to, to, uh, to have a, uh, a guarding situation of, of where a, a certain development is supposed to go. Once you know that in a certain space people are supposed to live in the future, you would have to do all the things you need to have there, which is schools, uh, the, the public transportation, um, all those other kinds, uh, all those other issues, but also uh, public spaces to work, to meet, and to develop new things we don't know of today, which is, I think, the big challenge. The big challenge is to have spaces to develop something which you do not know today, what will be developed tomorrow. This is so challenging, so it's about creating spaces. Thank you very much for your answer. I have forgotten to introduce Irina Mastusova, the deputy CEO of uh, Film Studio of Soyuz Film. I would continue to talk about the creative entrepreneurship and the importance of creative entrepreneurship for this city, about new things that we are not, don't know about right now. So the question to Rui Mareira, how do you define the importance for the city? What, why creative entrepreneurs come to the city and work in the city? How do you choose? Focus on this part of economy, not on other part of economy. Why is it important for Porto? Uh, in 2001, Porto was a capital of culture together with uh, Rotterdam. We did a lot. Uh, we built the Casa de Music, the House of Music, with Rem Kulas, who was with us yesterday. We had the Museo de Sarrauge, the Contemporary Museum, which is fantastic. Suddenly, the city sort of abandoned public uh, um, policies in terms of culture. Uh, for 12 years, we had a sort of technocratic government in the city, which thought culture has to develop it by itself. And Everybody knows the crisis we had. In 2013, we were called the pigs. We were in good company with the nice countries, but we were pigs. And we had a lot of unemployment, and it was necessary to boost the economy and to think, how are, how are we going to, to react to this um, crisis of pessimism, if you want? And we thought culture is the main tool. We thought culture makes the perfect triangle with the economics, creation of jobs, creation of opportunities, very fast growing, small business, um, and at the same time with social cohesion, because we wanted to foster cohesion at a time when middle class was being particularly hit. And in we thought culture must be the cement back in society. We can't use sport for that, because every person has a different team. Uh, we can't use religion anymore like it was used in the 18th or 19th century, and culture is really what, what the success. And we thought, well, we have a good university, we have a good scheme, we have people who in 2001 had participated in this uh, upheaval in the city with uh, Porto as being the, the cultural center of Europe for one year with, with Rotterdam. And we thought, how can we do it? Basically, we needed to reclaim some of the things, um, the municipal theater, which had been given to private sector for commercial theater. We called it back. But we said we are going to use the companies and the small associations of the city, but also to bring the best we can find in the world and try and bring that. Another thing is we try to foster creative industries through the startups connected to the university, to the faculty of architecture, which is very well known, faculty of arts. And then we decided we need, however, to involve everyone. Traditionally, what cities do when they sort of bet on culture is they invite the improbable people uh, to come to our museums. It's the easy thing, you know, give, a, give some tickets away, invite the people every Sunday or something like that, free tickets. We thought it doesn't change anything. It will keep still the elite going to the 
shows on, on, on a nightly basis. And every now and then, because we want to feel comfortable, we invite the poor people in. So we thought, no, we, we just have to take culture where culture is most improbable. And not only take action there, but to turn the citizens into not only spectators, but also into actors. It meant injecting in the poorest areas of the cities some creative industries, which we fostered, with the best um, film directors we had in the city, with people in terms of ballet, with people in terms in, of theater. What we found out very soon was what seemed an impossible investment really multiplied very fast. So we found out that creative industries, also from abroad, they looked at Porto as the sort of if you want an environment, if, if you want an ecosystem. And they started investing in the ecosystem and bringing people in. So some of the most derelict areas of the city, uh, which were all industrial parts of the city, we had lost the industry. Now suddenly they are flourishing exactly in terms of creative industries, not only from the city, of course. It is, it is a sort of general movement. It's like a whirlwind that is coming to the city. And that's basically the strategy we are developing. How to give these companies now, these small activities, which were startups, how can we scale them up? And that is the target we are doing. How can we, from, from 20 or 30 or 40, some of them very good in terms of volunteering, some with very good ideas, how can we help them to manage it into becoming um, actors in economic development? And that has created employment. It's created a new interest towards the city and also, it was a good investment because it created branding in the city. And branding in the city attracted business. And that's basically what we have been doing. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Vladimir Filipov how Moscow is working with creative industries and the creative platforms. How are you developing and supporting this creative platform? And which challenges and obstacles or maybe the positive experience have you faced over the recent years? Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, when we are talking about the creative economy, very often we imply that it may develop not only in private sector. That's how it happened uh, out of films, literature, the classical Russian literature from Chekhov's times, that the officials are uh, not very flexible people. and. Uh, uh, the mayor was right. Very often we seem that uh, you need to go simple way in order to attract people to the cultural practice. But how occurred in the 20th century in our country, I would like to demonstrate to our colleagues who have visiting, uh, been visiting our city that Moscow over the 20th and 21st century received maybe the biggest in the world, the network of cultural institutes. We have 451 museum and exhibition halls, uh, 1,600 1, libraries, 250 other institutes, and most of them were under the state governance. And now the story was true, but being the government of Moscow, which is the founder, finances this institutes, we bear extra responsibility how to make these institutes work efficiently, for them to be very attractive for the visitors, for them to share very important uh, meanings and messages. And thanks to this effort, Moscow can become a more important cultural metropolis. We are doing much in this respect, but I'd like to show that we pay very much attention to understanding the audience of our focus on the creative industry development, not the goal. It is a tool. It is one of the tasks for the Moscovites and the tourists visiting our city more often visit our institutes and the level of loyalty through the uh, cultural development is to become better. So our aim is to make the city more attractive. So to this end, we are holding many events when over the recent years have become one of not only expected for Moscowites, but for the guests of Moscow. If we take a look at the theater statistics, every year we have more plays, more 
performances, different events in the theater community and the premieres in the theater starting 2010, thanks to the efforts which have been made. It's a the task not only the state but Pride Museum. We have increased by 70% the attendance of Moscow museums. It is one of the biggest growth rate in Europe. Maybe we agreed to the criticism. Maybe the, there was a low base where you started. Maybe it's true. But the growth rate say by themselves. We do understand why sometimes we were lagging behind per thousand of people in terms of the attendance of museums and other cultural institutions to our colleagues from other global cities, from London, from New York, from Paris. Over the last decade that we organized our school students get into the museums, but when we grow, the standard of behavior is the same, that someone is to organize you and you go to the museum in groups. And we lost in individual terms of point. The mayor of Moscow made a decision then starting last year for all the Moscow uh, students, all Moscow visiting Moscow museums was free. But it was very important for us to compete for the school students, to develop very interesting programs, not to provide the free access, but for every student, uh, the museum, got the full ticket coverage for, for to enable competition to see what kind of children attend the museums. This project, the Museum for Children, involved one third of all the school students who didn't used to visit the museum before that. We have a big network of libraries. The mayor made a decision that the libraries should be not only the venue to read the book, but there to be full public space of the creative development where a person lives the, to the library. You can reach within walking distance 10 minutes from any point in Moscow. Now we are turning it into the public space. Of course, we need to uh, do up the libraries to m make them high tech, to be more equipped. And the mayor of Moscow uh, decided to allocate all 0.5 billion of rubles starting this year, within four or five years, we are going to modernize the Moscow libraries for them to become the public space, very attractive, very interesting, with very interesting content inside. It's a huge program for 11 billion of rubles to turn all the 150 uh, schools of arts. We are going to do them up for three years. We are changing the musical instruments facilities. It is the biggest investment on the part of the state of Moscow government. We are discussing this issue with our colleagues. This is the biggest investment in kids, creative development and creative in children's art. And we do understand, we do hope that in three years, Moscow will have the most high tech and developed network of arts education. Talking about the creative economy, the priority starting 2018, Moscow as a city which within five years is to be on the screens of the world's movies, to be such popular compared with Rome, New York, London, Hong Kong, Amsterdam, we create in 2018 Moscow uh, Special Movie Assessment uh, Committee. Of course, we were didn't have transparent system of approval for foreign colleagues and they didn't understand to whom to apply to make a movie in Moscow starting from visa and just not clear system of logistics we created on the basis of the Department of Cultural Development in the Moscow uh, Movie Commission which is not only the creative uh, business angel for all those uh, wants to shoot a movie in Moscow but now we are working with the development of the system to provide financial incentives so f to uh, cover some of the expenses within five years we are going to reach the targeted indicators in the number of tourists and the image of our city in the world will become even more objective it is very important for us and we do understand that the culture plays a m crucial role and the last message I would like to share with you which uh, proves 
our movement forward, that we are ready and we are changing. I'll be honest with my colleagues from different cities sitting here at the same table, very often participating in, in foreign international meetings with the heads responsible for the cultural developments of the biggest city, that uh, 10 years ago in Moscow we were not the Department of Culture, but we were the department under the special department for responsible for the cultures, but our predecessors dealt with the development of the institutes which were under the auspices and we were financed directly. Now we are not the department at particular institute of the culture, but we're the department responsible for the culture itself. We're not the competitor, but we're the umbrella for the private cultural institutes uh, for other agencies and our task uh, for Moscow to continue the trend in order to get more private museums, private libraries, private exhibition halls for the movie to be shot uh, by more people. It will uh, have a synergy effect. Thank you very much for your attention. I have a short question. Thank you for your contribution. And uh, how do you think uh, Moscovite's attitude to the city has changed? Thank you to thanks uh, to your effort. What new things uh, have they seen and understood uh, in the city after they got a chance uh, to go to the library ten minutes away? Very striking figures uh, are given by sociology and statistics. Talking about libraries. 80% of Moscovites, uh, frankly, confess that in the recent five, seven years, uh, neither themselves uh, nor the members of their family have gone to a library. But if something starts going on in the, with the library in the neighborhood, for example, a bank uh, or a store will be opened uh, instead of the library, they are ready to stand for the library. So it proves a high level of loyalty and trust. And uh, the job of a librarian is even uh, more respected uh, than that of a teacher or a doctor. But we understand that uh, people meet uh, doctors and teachers more, and they might have some negative experience, but they meet uh, librarians uh, more rarely, that's why they believe that they are sacred. But still, we understand that when we change uh, the public space, we change the attitude to Muscovites. And uh, uh, Muscovites say that uh, their attitude to libraries also reflects their attitude to government. And uh, yesterday, Mr. Sabanian compared uh, answers of uh, citizens uh, of different cities of the world uh, saying where they want to stay and where they want to go. For example, 25% of people in Hong Kong uh, want to live, and as for Moscow, uh, people want to stay here. They want to live uh, to bring up uh, their kids. And it is also important for us to create such an atmosphere that people from other countries would like to come here. Thank you very much. My next question will go to Alisa Prudnikova about the cluster that they are working on. We have been talking a lot about municipal and state involvement into cultural production, and your project is an example of a public and private partnership in culture, and it unites creative and technological components. So could you share with us uh, some features of your project, what is important uh, there to you, and how you elaborated it, and what do you want people to get from it? Thank you very much. I would uh, like to begin now with uh, the fact that uh, I was preparing uh, my uh, presentation uh, as a certain uh, debate with Mr. Florida, and uh, I am really sad that I don't have this chance. But I would like to say that uh, when we are at Moscow Urban Forum, it is always important to remember that Russia goes beyond Moscow only, and competition for creative uh, capital that uh, Moscow government focuses on now is an achievement of recent times uh, for not many regional cities that have understood that that is a competitive edge and the creative capital is capital and they need to fight for it. And several years ago in Yekaterinburg, uh, for example, 
We had discussions uh, on preservation of constructivist uh, legacy and the bureaucratic stance was uh, really clear that constructivism is architecture for the poor and uh, poverty cannot uh, be a feature of the region. That's why it should be changed. And uh, a lot of different institutions, uh, museums, uh, activists, uh, architects uh, had to invest a lot of effort uh, to go from bottom working with the cultural environment uh, to somehow change uh, this myth and superstition. And since then, uh, Yekaterinburg uh, is uh, bearing this uh, flag of uh, constructivism uh, and now is bidding for Expo 2025. And we know that Fon Calvert uh, is now indexing the creative capital of Russian regions. And in the recent couple of years, the agenda on how to calculate KPI in cultural projects uh, has uh, come into the agenda of economic forum, where culture used to be on the agenda of only cultural program for the participants. And I believe that that is a serious step forward and a serious change for today as well. And, you know, I'm representing a flange of practices. So I am doing, I'm creating these cultural creative projects. And we have been saying that culture changes uh, territories for a long time. But you know, one of the most serious issues today is that uh, we can share best practices only, saying that uh, we have succeeded in this and that. But as of today, we do not have a clear methodology on how to calculate and assess the results of cultural projects, how to discuss it with business, with government, how to convince our stakeholders that that is a value. And uh, when we start thinking about uh, this issue, when we understand that that is our context, we have held several uh, fora that uh, were based on the topic culture as an event. And I can share with you some deliverables of certain cases. And I'm connected with two cases that I'm really proud of, and uh, that is Octava Industrial Cluster, as mentioned by Vasily, and uh, Ural's Industrial Biennale of Modern Art. These are two cases, and Biennale that uh, was created first and it inspired Octava project. So we took on such a strategy that any art project uh, should go beyond simply being an art project, and then it will be a success. And having understood that we cannot simply account for the governmental support or our own initiative and enthusiasm, we understood that we need to meet three conditions, that it is global agenda, that is what is interesting to the world. Industrialization is a continuous topic that is up to date for all the countries on the earth. And another condition is interest and sincere feedback from business and our platforms were industrial facilities uh, that uh, continue manufacturing something, starting from porcelain and uh, up to tanks. Artists uh, can give us uh, totally different values and senses, and they all, uh, the industrialists uh, and business, understand that. Another condition that has to be met is that it complies with the identity of the location. And uh, we have heard that uh, the Urals is the foundation region of uh, the country. This idea has lived for a long time, but we needed to give it a new life. Talking about Tula, that also is a success story. And that is when uh, you have a powerful industrial partner that initiates some project. 
And when the authorities are ready to support the project, and it's not like a, some uh, outer policy that says, okay, you great, uh, you have a great uh, factory, Octava, that manufactures uh, microphones, uh, let us create a cluster. No, that's not about that. That was about hearing the demand of people that work there in that territory, which is not uh, problem free because uh, Tula is uh, not far away from Moscow and their main challenge is to prevent the outflow of population to make sense for the people to stay in the territory, to work there. And Octava cluster, you know, was kind of experiment and a really cool case, not of simply elaborating creative infrastructure, but a case of coming up with infrastructure that meets the demand of specific people in the location right and now. And there are certain anchor stories there as well. For example, I elaborated a museum of lathe that is the key story and the concept of a lathe is the idea of uh, the fact that this museum will uh, never get old and it's pretty hard uh, to come up uh, with a museum interesting museum of a lathe and that would attract uh, people to the permanent uh, display many times and uh, we have come up uh, with uh, constant renewing display when you can visit there and uh, you would see museum created on a totally new scenario and I am happy to invite all of you there to see it with uh, your own eyes so that we can uh, prove with the certain figures and to verify the theory that cluster can change the flow of people to certain location and that it can change the attitude of the people who live there to this location. And I believe that it is always fair to consider and to discuss different specificity of the territories and we have to understand that there is no super universal idea and uh, clusters in Yaroslav and Vladivostok are not uh, super winning stories uh, but these are stories of uh, working on uh, our own errors uh, and overcoming something and I believe that uh, the agenda for our forum is uh, not simply to discuss success stories, but also to discuss uh, stories of mistakes that we should avoid. Thank you very much. And I would like uh, to continue talking about uh, how to retain uh, people in the cities, providing them opportunities uh, for jobs uh, and uh, come up with uh, clusters. And uh, my next question uh, will go to Rule van Herbt. You are dealing with a project uh, called Agency Agency, and you are also advisor to the mayor of Amsterdam. And uh, before we started, uh, you told me something about the importance uh, of giving people space uh, for creative industry and creative economy, not only for work, but for life. And could you please elaborate on your experience? Sure. Thank you for your question. Um, so on the one hand, I'm, I'm running in a, a bureau called Agency Agency. Um, and we do consult and we give branding advice to big cultural institutes. But actually now I want to talk about a completely different project, which is not about big institutes, but it's about the people that make up the creative industries, which in the end are the artists and the creatives. Um, I would like you to, or I invite you to take a look at the screen just to give you a little bit of context. Uh, I am from Amsterdam. I'm advising the mayor of Amsterdam on this particular project. And this is a bit what is happening in Amsterdam, as it is happening, I guess, in many cities. On the right, you see a contemporary image of the city, which is very popular, popular place for people to live, pop popular place for people to visit. Uh, only some decades ago, it was very different. The city was uh, partly empty. There were less inhabitants. Uh, people, uh, artists were squatting places and there was sort of 
this tension in the city. So now we have, a, let's say, a lot of people think a much more pleasant situation, which is partly true. Um, but I will come back to that uh, uh, after this slide, just to finish the contact situation. Amsterdam, a very small city, less than a million inhabitants, and sort of up to in the direction of 10% of the people that are active in the creative industries. But there's actually a sort of a downside to this positive image that I just showed you, and that is reflected. I can give you a lot of data, but I decided to bring it back to one slide. And here you see the development of a house price <laughs> in Amsterdam. And uh, especially in the last years, you see that this, the, the enormous pressure on the city. And it's becoming a, a city for wealthy people, basically. <coughs> so the house prices, uh, they rose with 70% uh, only four years' time. Um, and this is a problem. This is especially a problem for low-income groups. And starting artists and starting designers and starting creatives are part of this low-income group. So we are losing them. Um, so the question that the city of Amsterdam has is how can we attract and retain these kind of people because we want to stimulate diversity and we want to remain a vibrant city. So how to do this? Um, the, 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 the key thing is by creating affordable spaces for these creatives to work and also preferably to live in the city. Um, there's this project and the project is also, I think, a really nice example of a, a private public collaboration. So it's a collaboration between the city, between real estate developers and betwe between the creatives. And it works like this. I will try to explain it very quickly in six steps. So people are invited to submit plans. These are the real estate developers to the city of Amsterdam for uh, offering creative spaces. And they can get a subsidy in return. And what they have to do is to offer uh, ateliers, so workspaces and residencies to artists. They have to apply for these spaces if they are interested in, uh, in them by showing their portfolio. They get approved if everything looks good. And this is the most important step. Uh, it allows them to rent these spaces for a price which is lower than the market price. So this is the project. And just to give you some uh, better idea of what this in reality means, I will show you, I think it's like 12 or 15 examples of spaces that were co-developed with this program. And I can show you many more, but it's just to give you some impressions also of the diversity of the spaces. Some are very alternative, some are more business oriented, but it's very diverse. And it's all around the city, which you can see reflected on the uh, right bottom of the slides. So this is a former dockyard, a former prison that is turned into creative spaces. I just invite you to take a look at the diversity of the spaces and the different spaces that are created in former school buildings, former hospitals, also newly built buildings, former printing office. And I can continue like this. So these are all kinds of spaces that are created within the program. They are on the fringes of the city, but also this example in the city center, in the canal belt, etc. These are some statistics. I actually also want to make the point here that it's a very, very modest program. Uh, as you see here on the fourth point on the left, the annual city budget for this uh, project is only 2 million uh, euro per year. Uh, and I think also the lowest statistic on the slide is interesting, the average rental price for the uh, artists and creatives, because this is actually the payoff of the, of the whole project, is that they can rent their spaces for only 50 or 75% of the market price, which makes the city more affordable for them. Um, this is actually an example of, uh, because we do still have a lot of problems, um, this is an example of last year when one of these spaces have to leave and you see a projection of uh, 10 years. It's a project by uh, OMA, did, did the master plan. So here you see again this pressure on the city and also these uh, actually <coughs> sort of creatives being pushed out of the city. Um, so my takeaway for today would be also here, I would invite the, the people that uh, run their cities to look at this. Um, I think a uh, very important point is to look at 
uh, creative spaces to work and live as part of the creative infrastructure. So we don't only talk about uh, institutes, but also about uh, places for people to live and work. Um, the city of Amsterdam has been selling a lot of real estate in recent years. I would really urge uh, cities, if they still have space, keep it in your own hands because it's really important. Once you sell it, it's gone and you can never bring it back. Having said that, I don't think that cities themselves should create these kind of cr uh, creative spaces. So the third point is to provide guidelines for creative real estate developers, maybe also groups of artists to develop these spaces themselves. There's much more sense of ownership and people like to work and live in these kind of places. And the last point is try, like in, if you give subsidy, for example, try to negotiate that it's a long-term project and maybe if it's a temporary project that the people that develop it get a new place afterwards or commit themselves to a new project afterwards. So this is what I wanted to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are getting to the Russian experience of the creative space for the creative economy. Sergei is a person who creates and runs such spaces. It would be interesting to hear your experience about the problems and challenges and the changes which have occurred, how your average uh, tinder has changed, what uh, contribution they make to the economic development of Moscow and Russia. First of all, I'd like to point out that I'm here in minority, the only representative of business, actually. Frankly speaking, business is the aim, main aim of business to make money. Uh, other things are hobby or charity. So the question why our company decided to engage in the creating uh, creative clusters development is very interesting. It is in the field where business chooses this direction of development. In fact, the answer is the following, that we are seeking the real estate sites, which can be used as a creative clusters, and it is more interesting for in terms of business, in terms of the maximization of profit. It is very interesting that uh, I speak after helped how Amsterdam is organized. So our project in Moscow is compared with all creative clusters in scale. So now we have about 100,000 square meters, and this is a single creative cluster. This cluster is a brand up play is 15 years. This uh, year we have been going towards this project for a long time. As of today, we have one big project in Moscow and the second in St. Petersburg. It is not that huge right now, but within some period of time, we are planning to scale up to 75,000 uh, square meters. Now, a couple of numbers, because business is all about figures. As of today, the revenue of our Moscow project is 1.5 uh, million of rubles per year, and we assess the average uh, revenue of our tenors of those creative industries which work in the city. Of course, it is the assessment, the preliminary estimate. We can say that about uh, 300 to uh, 500 million of years are uh, earned by our tenors. This is a huge business, this is a huge project. Why is it possible? And why are we interested in doing that, how it works? I think that in many cities there are places which are quite difficult uh, to be used in traditional development due to geographical location, architecture, peculiarities. In such places, the creative clusters should look for this is our business niche we are working with. As the shareholders of our companies, 
this is the business which takes us to account one indicator, uh, revenue and profit. These are two indicators which are very important for them. So we're working in a very harsh corporate uh, structure with all the uh, boards in place, the business and financial reports and financial statements. So everyday business uh, processes don't have any creative nature. So that's why we are working in very harsh competition, cutthroat competition, which is the real estate uh, market in Moscow, where <coughs> it is very difficult to survive. And all these 15 years, we've been working without any assistance or any particular subsidized uh, terms on the part of the state. So this is a big difference. Uh, talking about other projects, comparing us with European projects. I hope that this situation is going to change and we'll uh, get... Uh, the ch situation is changing for the better right now. That's what I would like to mention. And I hope that we will get some uh, assistance in our development from Moscow. But we don't see this kind of assistance so far. And how it works? Why does it work? And why are we still with a creative cluster, but we do not turn into something else? In fact, we are doing the work uh, like Amsterdam government does. We are creating special incentives and subsidies for creative businesses and cultural projects. And these uh, creative businesses and cultural projects attract uh, the flow of people, the traffic of clients, create PR for the venue attracts the interest of the mass public attention and the place, which used to be the dead blind spots near the railroad, become the center of life. So due to the fact that the venue has a large flow of people, we can earn on other tenors, on commercial uh, companies and commercial businesses which are interested in locating here. So the average of uh, these uh, subsidies for the creative uh, and normal market uh, uh, prices for other tenors creates a positive balance in terms of the standard utilization of this land as an office, mm, real estate, commercial real estate. I'd like to mention that as a business, that particularly this kind of scheme allows to create the sustainable structure which is independent of the rich angel or rich investment, the state policy, the willingness of a particular person to become even more famous or other motives. So this, uh, the strict economic feasibility foundation uh, creates for the stability. And that's is proven by the fact that we have been developing over the 15 years. And so this is the right approach of ours. And this is the main fact which proves it. And answering another question, so the education is developing quite appropriately and well on our territory over the last years. We have witnessed that this part of the creative industries in Moscow has been developing quite actively non-state education, non-public education. Over the last years, the territory covered by the educational facilities has increased twofold. Thank you very much for your input. We have the last uh, speech of Irina Mastusova, who represents the movie studio Soyuz Multfilm. Are you going to have a presentation? Can I be heard? I think you can join us. You know, I feel comfortable sitting a little bit higher, seeing everyone. I have a privileged position because I can answer particular cases which I was happy to listen to. Introducing my ideas in front of the young people, I'm always asking the question, do you know 
how many years is for the Russian animation. And I'm not going to ask this question. I'm going to give you an answer. In 2012, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Russian cartoon and animation. How the culture of the Russian animation is famous around the world and uh, it started to develop with Disney simultaneously in 1930s. Do you know any cartoons? There's a professional rating the best uh, cartoons of the all of the globe, and people, children, cannot answer when we speak about um, cartoon, uh, the tale of tales, our Nordstein, the current uh, classic representative of our cartoons. The question is in the 90s when the Hollywood moved to the industrial rail. Russia was in perestroika. So for the 15 years, we experienced huge collapse, which we shouldn't talk about. We're quite aware of this collapse. But animation industry uh, it felt, animation felt this very harsh. The animation industry didn't exist. The animation existed as a direction of the culture. In seven years ago, there was a created association of animation movies, and we believe that starting from that moment, it started to develop as an industry itself. And our task in the whole world, where animation didn't exist as an arm of the culture, it has very difficulties in terms of the creation, in terms of the producers and other things. We have the problems connected with technologies. We see the start of the industrialization of our animation industry with Smesharike project emergence, which uh, celebrated its 15th anniversary, is moving to a different level, happened uh, with uh, Masha and the Bear. We call animation the soft power of Russia, as it is well known around the world. And we do understand that Russian animation should cease to be the Cinderella of the movie, because our movies take the highest world global ratings and are very popular. We ex started the experience of other countries, for example, Seoul, where animation is included in the context of the creative industries of the city, of the country. And there is a list of direction areas which are included in the creative industry list. In Russia, we are just starting this path. This is the example of how Seoul is developing. It's uh, the Russian house of an animation that was the first aspiration moment. Several years ago, for the first time, 2011, we had a meeting with Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, and we raised the question of creating the Russian house of animation. It has been several years when the second meeting occurred a year ago, and one of the orders was the result of this meeting uh, was the techno park of the House of Russian Animation. For us, it's a great event itself. As Moscow, uh, on the 24th of June, we got the status of technological park. I would say that as other areas, we, it's quite difficult as the Soyuz Multfilm is a federal institute, the federal enterprise. The status of technological park was provided by Moscow, so cooperation with Moscow was very pleasant experience, very productive experience. So over the year, we've gone through the, all the stages of approval. So all the layers of the executive branch work in Moscow very, very well. And we were impressed by this kind of cooperation, the emergence of technological park, the first animation technological park in Moscow. This is the document which we received, the letter. For us, it plays a huge role, apart from the meeting with the President Putin entails very huge infrastructural changes in terms of the tax incentives, as the animation production is a long-term and very labor-intensive, financial-intensive process. This is the first, sorry, uh, much finance accounts for the salaries. We got the tax incentives. And the second point is the rental payments. So art play, you cannot bear this 
rental burden. So many studios tried to stay there, but there were no many studios left. So the appearance of such a technological park is going to provide a uh, very good rate for the rental payment. And it will allow to attract more animators, more people to be engaged in creation, more a creative product itself. We do hope and we believe that this success story is going to continue. So Moscow decided to come to terms with us, decided to meet us halfway in many areas, talking about the minimum volume of areas required for the technological park development. But now we are inspired by this kind of story. We would like to develop this kind of story. We are working on the expanding our space, and we're working on expanding the content of our activity. We do believe that the creative industry is not only animation. We're working with the movie industry, we're working with the cross-country of the children licensed products, as many products are under licensed brands, and there are many prospects for cooperation and for development in terms of the design, creation, and other re relevant industry. This is the case which we have been successful at. We are moving through this case. It is a very explicit and vivid positive case. And so we anticipate a great future thanks to how Moscow government works well in this regard and the Department of Culture with which we have been cooperating the most uh, film we have been tightly cooperating, supports the big fest of cartoons. This is our story as well. The audience animation fest, which has been in place for 10 years in the territory of Moscow, and both, as in case for our technological part, we do sub hope for the further support and sharing this information. Talking about the regions, we have the demand in a couple of cities. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, St. Petersburg uh, is the capital of Russian animation because Mishariki and uh, uh, Melnitsa and the saga about three Russian bogatirs, Voronish, Tomsk, Yaroslav, Tatarstan, all these cities look at us. They want to follow the suit of Moscow, and we are ready for cooperation in all the respects. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have about 10 minutes. I know that I need to let you go. Please give us, uh, Mr. Marera, can you give us the main advice for the people who want to support creative industry? What to start with? What is the first point to take a look at in terms of the city work for the creative industry to develop and to stay in the city? cannot um, itself, uh, the municipality cannot uh, um, replace uh, entrepreneurship. Um, so if, if you think that this is a sort of state program, you can't have it. But I think Royal Van Hept defined very clearly what is the condition. As cities become more competitive and attract more investment and attract tourism and attract real estate, the danger is that uh, creative industries are suddenly uh, at the moment when they, they start flourishing, they are thrown out. That is the basic problem every city has. So I fully agree that, first of all, cities should not sell a property. They should, th there are methods. One method we are using is leasehold. We are allowing private investors to invest in that land, but they have to give it back to us after 20 or 30 years, depending. And actually what we are doing is international tenders. And the faster it comes back to the city, the better placed the competitor is. And what we also define is on those, on those territories which we pass on to the, pro, to the land developers, they have to assign certain areas, certain proportions for creative industries in order to guarantee that, uh, because it's not only museums, we need creative industries, we need really um, places where people can develop their skills, where people can invest, where people can grow. Uh, and I, I think this is the, the real match we, we, we are facing, all the cities are facing. It's, it's almost a, a, a contradiction. The city starts becoming very active, very boiling because of the creative industries, and then the creative industries are kicked out. So the, 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 the whole thing is how to balance that. And I think that's where um, 
city policy has to concentrate, and we have been doing that effort on the old slaughterhouse, which is one of the projects we have just announced, and we announced it in uh, two years ago originally in Milano in the Triennial of Design. We tested an old industrial area, which is uh, something like 35,000 square meters, and we, we said, let's see if the market is able to respond. But we did not sell it. We put it on the market saying there is a leasehold for 30 years. Whoever wants to rebuild will, re will rebuild according to plan. But he has to give guarantee for the city, 40%. And the city, what it will do is use this 40% of the land for creative industries at rates which are not the market, allowing the, the investor to use the other 60% to develop a normal business and for the market. Thank you very much. I believe that we have uh, some time for a couple of uh, questions and answers, uh, but uh, to begin with, I would like to sum up what we have discussed. Creative economy is becoming extremely important for the cities. It attracts uh, cities, people to the cities, it improves the quality of life, it gives people a chance uh, to realize themselves in life and some tasks that creative economy is still facing is uh, to preserve the balance between uh, uh, chances to create something new and uh, stringent, rigid economy that uh, squeezes these people out of the cities. Today we have seen different examples uh, of successful cooperation between uh, city administrations, municipal authorities and business uh, and institutions, uh, large institutions uh, that develop significant industries. And as far as I understand, Russia is still going to cover a long way. Now Moscow is investing a lot of uh, effort and resources to make the city attractive. And uh, as far as I have heard, uh, therefore, it is uh, threatening the cities uh, nearby, attracting uh, people from uh, their locations. So these cities are facing a lot of challenge to somehow promote retention of the people. And we have heard some models and approaches to doing that. Regrettably, we did not discuss large investment projects that shape a totally new image of the city that much, like uh, is the case with the Opera House. And I hope that we will all follow this story and we will go to have a look at the result of this effort. I would like to thank uh, all of us and I'm really sorry that we have not heard uh, the patriarch of creative economy, but we have all heard and read him. And thank you all for coming and joining us and I hope that we will develop creative economy in the cities that we live in and uh, we'll do those uh, new, unknown and cool things that we have discussed. Thank you very much.